subtract the key. So let me show you how to do this in practice. Now, as you can see, I'm already running the payload dump engine against my task network, and I have already associated with it, as shown in the previous lecture. So the only thing that's left right now is to run the ARP replay attack in order to inject packets into the traffic and force the router to generate new packets and increase the number of data. To do that, we're going to use a replay ng again, and the command is actually going to be very similar to this command right here. So I'm actually going to copy all of this because I'm lazy, and I'm going to clear this and paste the command here. Now, there are only a few things that I need to modify. First of all, I don't want to run a fake authentication attack, so I'm going to remove all of this, and I want to run an ARP replay attack. Also, this attack does not take a number, so I'm going to remove this number, and I'm also going to replace the A with a B, and we're done. So, if you look at it, you'll see it's actually very similar to this command right here. We're using a replay ng, but instead of doing a fake authentication attack, we're doing an ARP replay attack. We're giving it the MAC address of my target network after the B instead of the A. Then we're giving it the MAC address of my wireless adapter after the H, which is identical to this. And then we're giving it my wireless adapter in monitor mode. Now, I'm actually going to associate again before I do that. And then I'm going to hit enter here. And what's happening right now is my wireless adapter is waiting for an ARP packet. Once there is an ARP packet transmitted in this network, it's going to capture it and it's going to retransmit it. Once it does that, the access point will be forced to generate a new packet with a new IV and we'll keep doing this, forcing the access point to continually generate new packets with new IVs. So you should just wait for it right now. We're literally just waiting for an ARP packet to be sent in the air. And as you can see, the number of data is increasing now very, very quickly, which means that we actually managed to capture an ARP packet. This ARP packet got retransmitted, forced the router to generate a new packet with a new IV, and we are continually doing this process, forcing the router to generate new packets with new IVs. So right now, we can go ahead and run Aircrack NG to crack this network. And before I do that, I'll actually just associate one more time. And then I'm going to do Aircrack NG and give it the name of the file which we're storing the data in, which is called ARP Replay. 01.cap. So I'm going to hit enter, and you'll notice the cracking process right now will actually require more data packets. The reason for this is I've actually modified the settings of this network so that it uses 128 bit key because in web you can either use a 64 bit or 128 bit key, and obviously. The 128 key is longer, therefore I actually modified the key length for this lecture to make sure it's the longest key possible. And as you can see, we still managed to get it within about 47,000 packets. We have the key right here in ASCII, and we have the key in here in hex, where we can use after we remove the columns. So perfect, now we managed to crack the target network. It was idle, as you could see, there was no data being sent, and we managed to do this by forcing the target access point to generate new packets with new IVs. In the previous lectures, we've seen how to crack the WEP encryption in minutes, even if the target network is not busy. Now, in the next lectures, we will talk about cracking WPA and WPA2. First of all, before we start talking about how to crack these encryptions, it is very important to understand that both of them are very, very similar. The only difference between them is the encryption used to ensure message integrity. 
WPA uses PKIP, and WPA2 uses <coughs> encryption called CCMP. In any case, this does not affect the methods that we're going to use to crack WPA and WPA2. Therefore, all of the methods that I'm going to show you from now on will work on both WPA and WPA2. Now, both of these encryptions came after WEP, and they were designed to address the weaknesses in it. Therefore, both of them are much more secure, and cracking them is more challenging. So, before we start talking about how to crack them, I want to cover a feature that, if enabled and misconfigured, can be exploited to recover the key without having to crack the actual encryption. The feature is called WPS. It allows devices to connect to the network easily without having to enter the key for the network. So it was designed to simplify the process of connecting printers and such devices. You can actually see a WPS button on most wireless enabled printers. If this button is pressed and then you press the WPS button on the router, you'll notice that the printer will connect to the router without you having to enter the key. This way, the authentication is done using an 8-digit PIN. So you can think of this as a password made up of only numbers, and the length of this password is only 8. So this actually gives us a relatively small list of possible passwords, and we can try all of these possible passwords within a relatively short time. Once we get this PIN, it can be used to recover the actual WPA or WPA2 key. So as you can see, with this method, we are not exploiting WPA or WPA2. We are actually exploiting a feature that can be enabled on these encryptions. So for this to work, first of all, we need WPS to be enabled on the network because it can be disabled. Also, it needs to be misconfigured, so it needs to be configured to use a normal pin authentication and not a push-button authentication. If push-button authentication is used, then the router will refuse any pins that we try unless the WPS button is pressed on the router. Therefore, the method will not work if push-button or PBC is enabled. So, in most modern routers, PBC comes enabled by default, or WPS will be disabled by default. So this method might not work. But because the WPA and the WPA2 are so secure and so challenging, it is always a good idea to check if WPS is enabled and try the method that I'm going to show you to crack the network. If it fails, then you can try the other methods that I'm going to show you after the next lecture. Okay, now that we know what WPS is and how it can be used to recover the password for WPA and WPA2 networks, let's see how to do that in practice. So, right here I have my tally machine. I've already enabled monitor mode on my wireless adapter on mode zero. Now, usually we use AeroDump NG to see all the networks around us. But right now, we want to see the networks that have WPS enabled, but because like I said, it's just a feature, and people can turn this feature off. So, first of all, I'm going to use a tool called WASH to display all the networks around me that have WPS enabled. So, we're going to do WASH, dash dash interface, and give it my interface in monitor mode, which is mod zero. So all we're doing is wash is the name of the tool, interface to give it the interface, and one zero is my wireless adapter in monitor mode. If I hit enter now, you'll see oh, it Jesus. lift my network straight away. Now I press Control C to cancel this, similar to Aerodon because it will keep running unless you cancel it. And you can see this is my target network, it's called test AP. It's given us the vendor of the hardware used in this network, in this access point. The LCK tells us whether WPS is locked or not, because sometimes WPS locks after a number of failed attempts. So right now this says no, which means that we can actually go ahead and try to guess the pin. 
Let's give enough the version of WPS. It's using version 1. The signal strength is in here, the channel, and the DSSID. Now, I explained the meaning of all of these things before in my AWODOM NGV lecture, so I'm not going to talk about them now. If you forgot the meaning of any of these terms, please go back to the AWODOM NG lecture. Now, this network actually uses WPA2. So just to confirm this to you, if I go here to my host machine and just try to connect to it, you'll see that it's telling me that this uses a WPA2 password. But like I said, we don't care if it's WPA or WPA2 because we're going to be exploiting a feature in these encryptions, which is the WPS feature. So now that we know our target network uses WPS, there is a good chance that this attack will work against it. The only reason it might fail is if the target uses PBC or push button authentication. Like I said, if the target uses PBC, then it will refuse all the pins unless the button is pressed on the router, and therefore this attack will fail. The only way to know is to literally try this attack and see if it works. So, I'm going to copy the MAC address of this network, or the DSSID, and the first thing that I'm going to do, similar to what we did with the WEP, I'm going to associate with the target network using a fake authentication attack. So basically, I'll be saying, I want to communicate with you, please don't ignore me, so that when I run the attack, the network will start accepting the pins and not ignore me. So, to associate, we're going to use the exact same command that we used when we did it with WEP. So we're going to use Airplay NG. We're going to tell it I want to run a fake authentication attack. We're going to give it the delay. So this is the time to wait between association attempts. Previously, we set it to zero, and we had to do this manually every now and then. Right now, I'm going to set it to 30, so that we associate with the target network every 30 seconds. Then, I'm going to do dash A to give it the MAC address of my target, and dash H to give it the MAC address of my wireless adapter in monitor mode, and we see that we can get this by doing hit config, and copy it from here. We said it's the first 12 digits. And I'll just replace the minus with the colon. And finally, I'm going to give it the name of my wireless adapter in monitor mode, which is Mon0. So I explained this in details before. That's why I did it quickly. If you don't remember how I did this, please go back to the fake authentication attack lecture. So the command is ready now, but I'm not going to execute it. I'm going to go down to the bottom terminal and run Reaver, which is the program that will brute force the pin for me, and only then I will associate with the target, because otherwise Airplay NG will fail to associate with my network. So I'm going to move to this terminal right here. I'm going to clear the screen, and we're going to run Reaver, which is the program that's going to brute force the pin, so it's going to try every possible pin until it gets the right pin. Once it has the right pin, it'll use it to compute the actual WPA key. So, user reaver is very, very simple. It's very similar to everything we've been doing so far. So, first of all, we have to type the program name, which is reaver. Then I'm going to do dash dash VSSID to give it the MAC address of my target network. So I'm just going to paste it. Then I'm going to do dash dash channel. And give it the channel of the target network, which is 1. Then we're going to do dash dash interface. And give it my wireless adapter in monitor mode, which is Mon0. So a very, very simple command. We're using Reaver. This is the name of the program that will do the brute forcing for us and give us the key. We're giving it the DSSID, the MAC address of my target. We're doing dash dash channel to give it the channel that my target is running on. And we're doing dash dash interface to give it the name of my wireless adapter in monitor mode. I'm also going to add two more options. I'm going to add dash VGV to show us as much information as possible. This is really helpful if it fails or things go wrong will be able to know what's happening, why things are going wrong. And I'm also going to do dash dash 
no associate. To tell Reaver not to associate with the target network because we're already manually doing that in here. So Reaver can automatically do this step right here for you. But I've seen that it fails a lot. Therefore, it's actually better to do it ourselves manually here and then tell Reaver not to associate. So now I'm going to hit enter to get Reaver to work. And I'm going to go up to the top terminal and I'm going to hit enter to associate with the target network, telling it please don't ignore us so that Reaver at the bottom here can brute force the pin and try every possible pin until we get the correct pin, which we'll use to get the password. And as you can see right now, Reaver is trying the pin, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And perfect. You can see the pin was actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. So it's a simple pin. It actually came with this pin. So I didn't manually set this pin. My router came from the factory with WPS enabled with this pin. So like I said, this still works. But again, not against all routers. From that, it was able to discover the WPA key, which is UAU RWSXR, and the name of the router is this AP. So I can literally go ahead and connect with this password, and I'll be able to connect to the network and see and decrypt all of the packets sent in the air. Now, if WPS is disabled on your target network, or if it's enabled, but configured to use push button or PDC, then the method that I showed you in the previous lecture will not work. Therefore, you will have to go and crack the actual WPA or WPA2 encryption. And like I said, when these encryptions were designed, the developers knew about the weaknesses in WEP, and they made sure that they properly fixed these weaknesses. They actually did a pretty good job at this. Therefore, we cannot use the same method used in WEP to crack WPA and WPA2. So in WPA2, the keys are unique, they're temporary, they're much longer than what they were in WEP. Therefore, the packets sent in the air contain no information that is useful for us. So it doesn't matter, even if we capture 1 million packets, we can't use them to crack the key. The only packets that contain useful information are the hashing packets. These are four packets transferred between a client and the router when the client connects to the network. So, in this lecture, I'm going to show you how to capture these packets, and in the next lectures, we'll see how to use them to crack the WPA or WPA2 key. First of all, as usual, you'd want to run Aerodump ng against all the networks around you. I've already done that, and as you can see, this is my target right here. It's using WPA2, and this is the MAC address. I'm going to copy it. And the first thing we'll do is just run Aerodump ng on this network and store the data in a file exactly the same way that we used to do it with WEP. So we're just going to do arrow ng dash dash bssid and give it the bssid of my target dash dash channel and give it the channel of my target which is one dash dash write to specify a file name to store all the data that we're going to capture in and let's call this WPA handshake because we're going to capture the handshake and finally we're going to give it my wireless adapter in monitor mode which is mon0 so very simple command we've done this multiple times by now we're using aerodom ng we're giving it the mac address of my target after the bssid i'm giving it dash dash channel to specify the channel of my target i'm using dash dash write to store all the data in a file this file will contain everything that we capture. So if we capture the handshake, it will be in this file. And finally, I'm giving it the name of my wireless adapter in monitor mode. So now I'm going to hit enter. And as you can see, Aerodump ng is working against my target network. 
And right now, all we have to do is literally sit down and wait for the handshake to be captured. Like I said, the handshake is sent when a client connects to the network. So we'll literally have to sit down and wait until a new client connects to the network. Once a new client connects, we will capture the handshake and you will see it here, Aerodump telling us that the handshake has been captured. Alternatively, we can use something that we learned before, which is a deauthentication attack. We know using that attack, we can disconnect the client from the network. So we can do this for a very short period of time. We can disconnect this client from the network. He will automatically connect once we stop the attack. Therefore, when he automatically connects, the handshake will be sent in the air and we will be able to capture it. This way, we will not have to sit down and wait for someone to voluntarily connect to the network. So, we've seen how to do this before, and it's going to be exactly the same command as we did it before. We used Aeroplay NG, we did dash dash the odd, then we specified a really large number of packets to keep the client disconnected for a long period of time. This time, I'm going to set this to 4 to only send 4 the authentication packets. This way, my client will be disconnected for a very short period of time. They won't even feel that they got disconnected, but this is enough for the handshake to be sent because they will be disconnected, they will automatically connect, and when they do that, we will capture the handshake. Now, the next argument we want to set is the MAC address of my target. So we're going to do dash A followed by the MAC address of my target. Then we're going to do dash C followed by the MAC address of the client that we want to disconnect. So it's this client right here. I'm going to copy, paste it here, and finally we're going to give it the name of my wireless adapter in monitor mode, which is mon0. And we are done. Again, I've spent a full lecture on this command explaining what the authentication attack is. So if it's a bit confusing, please go back and revise that lecture. Basically, all we're doing is we're using Airplay NG to run a deauthentication attack to disconnect this device for a very short period of time. That's why I'm setting this to only number 4. Then I'm using dash A to specify the MAC address of my target. Dash C specify the MAC address of the client connected to this network. And then I'm giving it my wireless adapter in monitor mode. Now I'm going to hit enter and keep an eye on this side right here. You'll see the handshake will be captured in here. So I'm going to hit enter. The authentication packets are being sent. And perfect. As you can see, once the client connected again, we received the handshake. So now we can quit Aerodump NG, so control C because we have the handshake now, it is stored in the file that we set after the right option, which is called the UPA handshake. And in the next lecture, I'll show you how this handshake can be used to get the key for the network. From the previous lectures, we learned that when it comes to WPA and WPA2, the only packets that contain some information that can help us with cracking the key are the handshake packets. And in the last lecture, we learned how to capture the handshake and store it in a file. Now the handshake does not contain any information that can help us to recover or recalculate the WPA key. The information in it can only be used to check whether a password is valid or not. Therefore, what we're going to do is to create a word list, which is basically a big text file that contains a large number of passwords. Then go through this file, go through the passwords one by one, and use them with the handshake in order to check whether this password is valid or not. You can actually download ready word lists from the internet, but in this lecture, I want to teach you how to create your own word list, and in the next lecture, I'm going to explain to you how the word list and the handshake are used in order to recover the password 
and we'll see how to do that in practice. So in this lecture, we're going to learn how you create your own word list using a tool called Crunch. This is a really handy skill to have under your belt if you want to be a penetration tester, because you're going to face a lot of scenarios where a word list attack can become very handy. So using the tool is very simple. All you have to do is just put the name of the tool, and then you specify the minimum number of characters for the passwords to be generated. Then we're going to specify the maximum number of characters for the password. Then you specify the characters that you want to generate passwords from. For example, you can put all lowercase characters, all uppercase, you can put numbers, digits, or you can just specify a, small, a smaller number to make the word list smaller. You can also use the option T, which is an optional, to give a pattern. So for example, let's say that you are looking at the person while they are typing their password, and you see that the password will start with an A. So you can tell Crunch that the password will start with an A, and then give me all possible combination of, of, of passwords that start with an A. And after that, we use the minus O option to specify the file name where the passwords are, are going to be stored. So we have a small little example here that will generate uh, a list of passwords that contain that start from six characters to eight characters and contain these characters right here. So it's going to create combinations of one, two, three, A, B, C, and the dollar sign. And it's going to store it in a file called wordlist. And these passwords are going to start with an A and end with a B, and it will generate passwords based on all possible combinations between the A and the B. So all of these generated passwords will always start with A and end with B. So let's have an example of the tool. Now the tool actually has a lot of options other than what we've seen so far. So if you just type in man, crunch, you'll see all the options that you can set and you'll see detailed description about all of these options. So it's actually really, really good. You can go ahead and spend some time to get familiar with the tool. Now I'm going to show you the example, and based on the example, you'll be able to run all of these commands. But if you want to run or create some advanced word lists, then I highly recommend that you go over this. One of the really cool options that I want to highlight is the minus P option. The minus P option tells Crunch to generate passwords that don't have repeating characters. For example, when you specify all lowercase characters, you specify A, B, C, D, it'll start by generating passwords made of A, 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 and then A, A, B, and then A, B, 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 and all of that. So when you do this, Crunch will actually ignore these type of passwords and it'll only create passwords that don't have any repeating characters. And that will reduce the size of the word list from the number of characters to the power of the length to the number of characters factorial. If you scroll down, you'll actually see more examples of commands and the type of word lists that will be created. So again, you can have a look at these and get yourself familiar with. Once you're done looking at the command, you can just press Q and you'll be out of it. And we're going to run our command here. So we're going to use crunch. And again, I want to generate passwords of minimum of six characters and maximum of eight characters, and I want them to contain combinations of A, B, C, and let's say the digits one, two. Now in here you can actually keep listing things, you can list characters, you can list uppercase characters, or even symbols if you wanted to. Once you're done with listing the characters, we're going to specify the file to save it to, and we're going to save it in a file called test.txt. So the command is very simple. It's crunch, minimum length of the password, the maximum length of the password, followed by the characters that we want to use to generate passwords from, and then O to the file that the passwords are going to be stored in. You can hit enter. And as you can see now, it's telling us that it generated 448,000 passwords, approximately. And they're all stored in a file called test.txt now. The size of the file is 4 megabytes. And now I can open this file by doing cat test.txt. And as you can see now, we can see all the passwords that have been generated. I'm going to control C out of it because it's a huge file. 
And as you can see, it actually contains all possible combinations of A, B, C, 1, 2. I also want to show you an example of using the minus T option. So I'm going to set this to only 6 to 6, so it's only 6 characters. And we're going to use the minus T option, which is the pattern option. And I'm going to tell it that I want the password to always start with an A. And then I want you to fill all possible combinations of characters between the A and the B. So I want passwords that start with an A and end with a B. And in the middle, at the outside, you can fill all possible combinations of A, B, C, 1, 2. Yeah, hit enter. As you can see now, the number of passwords is much less. It's only 625 passwords because I narrowed down the possibilities of passwords. Again, if I do cat, test.txt, you'll see that I have all the passwords right here. So this is it. Fill is really useful. can be used in many scenarios. I highly recommend that you spend some time with it. And also have, have a look on some of the existing word lists out there on the internet. Now, from the previous lectures, we learned in order to crack WPA or WPA2, we need to first capture the handshake, and second, have a word list which contains a number of passwords that we're going to try, and hopefully one of them will be the password for the target network. So right now I have both of these components, and we are ready to go and crack the password. To do this, aircrack ng is going to unpack the handshake and extract the useful information. The LIC right here of the message integrity code is what's used by the access point to verify whether a password is correct or not. So it's going to separate this and put it to the side, and then it's going to use all of the other information right here combined with the first password from the word list to generate an MIC, another message integrity code. And then it's going to compare this MIC to the one that's already in the handshake. If the MIC generated using this information plus the first password is the same, then the password used to generate this MIC is the password for the network, Otherwise, this password is wrong, and it will move to the next password. Again, it will do the same. It will use all of this information, combined with this password, generate a new MIC, compare this new MIC to the one that's already in the handshake. If it's correct, then this is the password. If it's not, then it's going to move on to the next password. And it will keep doing this through all of the passwords in my word list. If any of them generates the right MIC, then this is the password for the network. Otherwise, we won't be able to get the password. That's why the success of this attack really depends on your word list. So, let's see how to do this in practice. Right now, I have my word list right here. It's called test.txt. And I've actually manually added my password to the end of the list right here just so that when I run the word list against the handshake, I will actually find the password, because the word list did not contain my password by default. I also have the handshake file right here, as you can see, and all of this is in my home directory, which is my root directory. So if I do ls in here, you'll see I have the word list and the handshake file. So we're ready to run aircrack ng. So we're going to type the name of the program, as usual, followed by the name of my capture file, which is wpa handshake 01cap So, so far, it's identical to the way that we used to use it with WEP. The only difference right now, because this case is a WEP <laughs> network, we have to specify a word list with the dash W option. And the name of my word list is test.txt. So very, very simple. Aircrack is the name of my program. 
the WPA handshake 01.cap is the name of the file that contains my handshake, and I'm using dash W to specify my word this file. I'm going to hit enter. And as you can see now, aircraft ng is running through the word list, testing each word in the word list one by one, as shown in this diagram, calculating an MIC based on this information on the word list, and then if the MIC is correct, it's going to tell me that this is the password. Now, the speed of this depends on your processor and the size of your word list file. So if you have a huge file, obviously it will take you longer time. There are also online services that you can try where you upload the handshake and they have huge word lists and they have supercomputers to run through these word lists and try to give you the password. Unfortunately, I can't share their links with you, but you can easily find them on Google if you search for them. And perfect, as you can see, we managed to find the key. It's tell us the key is found and this is the key to the network. And this is the correct key because, as you know, this is the same key that we got when we exploited the WPS feature. So now we can go ahead and connect to the network and we'll be able to run all of the cool stuff that I'm going to teach you in the post connection attack section. Now this is the only practical way known so far to crack the WPA and WPA2 keys. There are methods to speed up this process so you can use the GPU for cracking because it's much faster than the CPU. That's if you have a GPU. You can also use rainbow tables. You can also pipe the word list as it's being created in crunch to aircraft ng. This way you can create bigger word lists without using any storage on your computer. There are also methods so that you can pause your cracking process and then come back after a while without losing your progress. But the main idea is the same. The only way right now to crack the WPA and the WPA2 is through a word list attack. You can use social engineering, however, to get the password using an evil twin attack where you trick one of the users to give you the password. This is actually all covered in my advanced network hacking course, the cracking using the GPU, pipe and crunch to aircraft NG, getting the password using an evil twin attack, and much more advanced network hacking techniques. If you're interested in that, then I highly recommend you have a look on my advanced network hacking course. Check out the bonus lecture of this course, the last lecture of this course. It contains links to all of my other courses and the comparison between them. we learned a number of techniques that hackers can use to gain access to networks, even if they use the WPA and WPA2. If this happens and a hacker manages to gain access to your computer, it's game over. They'll be able to run so much more powerful attacks to spy on every single connected device and potentially even gain full control over these devices. We will be covering all of that in the next section of this course, but before getting to that section, I want to spend one more lecture showing you how to implement the security settings that I recommended in the previous lecture to stop hackers from gaining access to your network and being able to do all of the attacks that I'm going to show you in the next section. So, to implement the changes that we discussed in the previous lecture, we will have to first access the router's settings page. And to do that, you're going to first need to go to your terminal, and we're going to run the ip route command. 
This is a very simple command that will simply show us the default gateways in our current network. So as you can see, the first default gateway is 10.0.2.1. This is the one for ETH0. And the default gateway is basically the router because as we know, the router is used as the default gateway to the internet. So this is the default gateway for the virtual NAT network that this machine is configured to connect to. And below it, we can see the default gateway for the real Wi-Fi network that LAN0 is connected to. It's saying that the default gateway for LAN0 is this specific IP address. Now, for you to see this, obviously LAN0 needs to be connected to your wireless network. So if I look here on my networks on the Wi-Fi and select network, you'll see that I'm actually connected to this network, which is my current Wi-Fi network. Now, if you're being re-authenticated and you're not able to connect to your own network using Wi-Fi, then you can connect to your network using an Ethernet cable. That way, the re-authentication attack will not work against you, and you'll still be able to see the default gateway IP in here and use it to access the router settings and modify them to improve your security. Once you see the default gateway, this is the IP of your, of your router, and this is the IP that will get used to access the router's settings page to modify its settings. So I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to go to my web browser, and we're simply going to put it in the address bar and navigate to it. It's going to ask you for a username and a password. Now, in many cases, you'll find this written under the router or at the back of the router on a sticker. If you can't find it there, then look at the manual for the default password. A lot of the time it's admin admin, or it could be the actual network key, the default network key. So, I already have my password copied in my clipboard, and I'm just going to paste it here and log in. And as you can see, we have access now to the router settings page. In this control panel, you can modify any settings that is related to the router. Keep in mind that your control panel might look different. This control panel looks different depending on the router that you have. But the, the settings that we want to modify are the same. So you're just going to have to look through it through the, the different tabs or the different layout that you have to find the settings that I'm going to modify. Now, as you know, the main thing that we want to modify is the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi settings. So in my case, I have it in here under this cog on the right. In your case, it might be in a different tab or in a different window or in a drop-down menu. You just want to make sure you find the Wi-Fi settings. So I'm just going to click on it in here. So in the basic settings in here, you can see you have the different bands that the router is running on. That's okay. You can see we have the network name, so you can modify it from here. You can see that it is set to visible, so you can unclick this box to make the network invisible, so it doesn't broadcast its name. The main thing that we want to modify in here is the security, and you can see in my case it's already set to WPA2 personal. So make sure you're using WPA2 for maximum security, and you want to make sure, as mentioned in the previous lecture, that you use a long password that is made of small and capital letters, special characters and numbers, and make it at least 14 characters. That way, it's very difficult to crack. Once you're done with your settings, you can click on Apply to apply the settings. But in my case, I haven't changed anything, so that's fine. The next thing we want to do, as you remember, we were able to crack networks regardless of what key they used, even if the key was complex, if the WPS pin authentication was enabled. So we're gonna, you're going to need to find where your WPS settings are. In my case, it's in here in a different tab. We're going to click on it, and we're going to make sure that it is disabled. So in here, as you can see, WPS is on in my case. So I'm going to click on it one click to disable it. And we're going to click on apply to apply the changes. In some routers, this will disable it for both bands. In my case, I need to manually also go to the settings of the 5 gigahertz by clicking in here and disable it manually for that. I got disconnected for a bit of time because when you change settings within the router, it will need to restart. So you need to give it some time once you click on apply or save for the router to, re to restart with the new settings. We're going to refresh now just to see if we have a bug. As you can see, we still don't have a bug, so we need to give it a bit of time. 
okay, so I'm being asked to log in again because the router restarted. And we're going to go back to the Wi-Fi settings, WPS, and as you can see, it's off now. So we also want to go to the 5 gigahertz, and we want to make sure it's off as well. You might not have to do this on your router, but in my case, I have to do it manually for the 5 gigahertz and for the 2.4 gigahertz. Another feature that you might find useful is the MAC filtering or access control. You might find it under different names. This allows us to define a list of MAC addresses that can connect or should be disconnected from the network. So from here, you can select to create an allow or a deny list. So if we go on the allow list, we're going to be specifying the MAC addresses that are allowed to connect to the network. All you have to do is simply put the MAC address here, add it, and save it. And then only these specified MAC addresses will be allowed to connect to the network. So that's pretty much it. You just want to make sure that you're using WPA2, disable WPS, and use a long password made up of small letters, capital letters, numbers, and special characters. You can also use the access control or MAC filtering to prevent or allow certain MAC addresses. Also, keep in mind, if you were being de-authenticated from your own network, so if you're not able to connect to your own network using the Wi-Fi settings in here through Wi-Fi, then you can connect to the router using an Ethernet cable, and that way the de-authentication attack will not work against you, then you'll be able to come in here, modify the network settings to prevent the attacker from launching attacks against you without being de-authenticated. In this section, we're going to talk about post-connection attacks, so attacks that you can do after connecting to your target network. Now, it doesn't matter whether the target network is a Wi-Fi network or a wired or an Ethernet network. It really doesn't matter. As long as you gain access to this network, as long as you're able to connect to it, you'll be able to do all of the attacks that I'm going to show you in this section. Now, you'll notice once connected, you can do so many cool things. So you'll be able to gather detailed information about all of the clients connected to the same network. You'll also be able to intercept the data and see any usernames, passwords, or any information they use on the internet. You'll be able to modify data as it's being sent in the air. So you'll be able to inject evil code and do so many cool things on the network. Now, to do all of the attacks that I'm going to show you in here, you have two options. The first option is to run the attacks against the virtual NAT network against the Windows machine. You just need to make sure that the virtual Windows machine is connected to the same NAT network as the Kali machine. Or you can run the attacks against real computers connected to your real Wi-Fi network and you need to make sure that you have a wireless interface connected to the Kali machine, and the Kali machine needs to be connected to your target Wi-Fi network. Now, throughout this section, I'm actually going to be using both options. So I'm going to be running some attacks against the Wi-Fi network, and I'll be running some against my virtual NAT network. Psalm 84 How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength, 
each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield, and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O God of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you.